Are we on my camera? No. What's up, people? Welcome to the feature. How you guys doing today? It's a Tuesday. I'm thrilled to be here. Had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving, no matter what part of the world you are. I'm thankful uh, for for all that we've gotten and for the so for so many people who have stepped up and purchased something, who supported us. We were smashing records. We're taking names and kicking butt. That's what we're doing. And I feel so good and so grateful for you guys. Now, I just want to tell you guys, even though we're in November, we just had Thanksgiving. I'm making a resolution here. This is a brand new Chris Doe. I'm going to chill the F out. Chill the F out right now. I'm going to calm down because I've been throwing out some negative energy for some of you guys. It's been really hard on my team. I'm going to try to be a better human being, and we're going to start not on January 1st, but right now, right here. So the team <laughs> has made a promise to me. To, to basically not wave the red flag at the raging bull. And maybe together we can have a more peaceful and harmonious show together. Yes. Um, okay. Let's say hello to the dream team. How are you guys doing? Hi, Chris. What's up, Chris? Hi, Molly. Hey, the new Chris. Hey, Aaron. I'm loving you. I just love it. <laughs> it's hello, nice Erica. to meet you, new Chris. <laughs> well, it's nice to be around such loving, supportive team members Love. that are fully competent <laughs> and going to bring their A game every single time on the show. Yes. Always. We are growing. We are progressing, you guys. I know that you guys have been somewhat critical. Most of you guys are very supportive of us, but some of you guys are critical, saying, Chris, you're too mean. You're just a little too harsh. You're an a-hole. You're a pompous blah, 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 whatever it is <laughs> they want to say. And that's okay. It's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. And I accept your criticism. I'm going to work on it. I'm making a pledge to you guys right now, right here today to work on this, to be a better human being, as I try to every single day of my life. And the other thing that you guys are critical of is you'll say things like the the team members are not articulate enough, and we're working on that together. So I'm asking you also to be patient yes. and to remind you guys that uh, Erica's background is in motion and animation, not in live editing or public speaking. And Do Molly's, they not like it? <clears throat> <laughs> no, they love it. No, no, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> no one likes you. No, no, no. <laughs> you guys, oh, okay. stay positive. Stay positive. And Molly's background is in graphic design. She wanted to do packaging. That's her passion. And as a former student of mine and as a friend, I've invited her to become part of the show. And so we're not professional broadcasters. Last but not least is Aaron. Aaron's background is in finance. It's the farthest away, the farthest away you can imagine, away from being a creative person. But he did something that's very brave and something I would encourage every single person out there who has this burning desire in their heart is to pursue your heart's desire. That's exactly what he did. So he's mostly self-taught. Aside from his experience working here with us, he's taught himself everything about <clears throat> shooting with a camera, about lighting, and about editing. So he's not a designer. And so he doesn't have that designer vocabulary especially. And that would not be fair of us to expect that from him. But he's grown in leaps and bounds, and you're going to see yes, him he too. Has. Um, his hair is getting smaller. His facial hair is getting shorter. <laughs> <laughs> his belly is getting smaller. I mean, there's a lot of growth. Yeah, there is. Uh, mental growth, not physical growth, and that was that's good. That's good. So you guys just keep that in mind. I know that we look like a fancy schmancy show with the beautiful <laughs> lighting. Of course, I have amazing lighting here, thousands of dollars of equipment just to make this look, you know, something, and. You could be fooled. You could be fooled to think that we're professional broadcasters. We are not. We're not journalism students. <clears throat> we're not English majors. We're not rhetoric majors. We're graphic designers. And I'm just f fidgeting with my mic or my headset. You good in there? You need, a, you need assistance? Yeah, you know, it's just What's going on it's there? pulling me down, dude. Hold on. I'm going to rearrange this. It's going to be less aesthetically pleasing, but it's going to be not be tugging and weighing down on my ear hole. You know, we should get the earbuds. Earbuds? Yeah. You can't. Okay. The dogs? The reason being is 
this is not a Bluetooth situation with my cabling, you see? Oh, got it. Mm-hmm. That would be a whole nother setup that I'm not prepared to do. Uh-huh. All right, I want to let you guys know the reason why we decided to get on this show today to do this live stream is because I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to Egypt. I'm super excited. I'm going to be going to the Rise Up Summit in Cairo. I, I know there are some, some horrific terrorist activities in there, but I'm not concerned. I think the spirit of our community lives on, and I'm going to go there mm-hmm and fully embrace uh, the culture, and I'm really, really looking forward to being in Egypt. And so I'm going to disappear for a little bit. <clears throat> I won't be back till next Tuesday, but fear not, fear not, because Matthew and Cena. everybody loves Matthew and Cena. I don't know anybody that doesn't love Matthew and Cena. I love Matthew. He's maybe he's, maybe yeah. his wife sometimes doesn't love him so much. <laughs> maybe Belinda has a problem from time to time. But Matthew's going to be doing style frames, and that's going to happen on Thursday at 11 a.m., so you guys mm-hmm. want to definitely tune in for that. And as always, Molly and Aaron are going to be manning the comments. But we're going to back off on the comments a little bit because we find it a little hard for us to focus while we're doing the show. So be patient with us. And you guys, don't keep hitting return and enter a thousand times. That's a good way to get you booted off the show, okay? Mm-hmm. And we want you to be here. <laughs> Anything else we need to talk about, you guys? No, do you, I have the Rise Up Summit website. Oh, let's show up. them that. Thanks, yeah. Molly. Thank you. So if you guys want to check it out, if you're in that area, that part of the world, I know you're not going to fly there specifically for this event. And let's scan through it a little bit. It looks very promising. Yes, it does. Now, somebody hit me up on social media. Oh, who's there that? I am. Who for a second that? there, Molly, I thought you were next to me. I'm like, damn, you're speaking with me? <laughs> really? What are you going to speak about? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you're not going to be speaking with me. There's Maybe. going to be a whole lot of people there. Maybe what? Maybe in a year. <laughs> Maybe in a year. Let's make a plan. Okay. So on my goals. Maybe you can be part of your own panel at Adobe Max coming up in October oh, yeah. in 2018. What are you going to be speaking about, Molly? That's a great question, Aaron. I'm going to brainstorm on that. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you have any ideas? Can no. we help you? Why yeah, not? you can help me. Yeah, let's do this. You guys, you guys are on Facebook and on, on YouTube. Why don't you make some suggestions as to what kind of topics you'd like for Molly to speak on? Yeah. Maybe it's uh, how to deal with it. A jerk. <laughs> how to work with a jerk. Dealing how to survive. With people. How to Dealing with difficult people. Yeah, how to meditate. I do that very well. You do. You are good at that. Yeah. That's why you should do that. Uh, like we can call it crying therapy. Who knows? There's a okay. lot of different th- shop, workshops that I'm sure you can run. Okay. So you guys, I hope you're flooding our channels with suggestions for Molly and the Let's things see. that she can speak about. And be brave, be bold, just and be beautiful. Say whatever it is you want. Okay? Now, on today's episode... It's going to be a long one. I want to prep you. A long one and, and maybe just like really meaty content. It's not going to be super sexy. But if you want to learn how to tell a story, this is it. And I'm finding that the parallels of what I've been learning for many years and things I've been teaching at Art Center are coming to help me with client relationships. We're not going to get into that a little bit too much. But it's interesting when I start to see and notice the patterns, um, especially because of Nancy Duarte's talk, uh, her TED Talk how she had thought that as a person speaking up on stage that she was the hero and it dawned upon her that she's not the hero. She's the mentor. She and and the the audience, her clients are the heroes and she's trying to help them tell their story to guide them along the way. And I I think if you keep that in mind as, as a point of reference, when we get into the deck, just be paying attention to see how that might work out for you. And it may be something that I talk about in the very near future. Okay, I think that's enough. Okay. I'll talk unless you guys want to say something. You guys want to say something? So tomorrow we have a live stream coming up with Matthew. Did he we... mentioned that. Oh, did he we did already talk about that? Not, not Thursday. tomorrow, Thursday. Thursday, sorry, I thought it was Wednesday. Um, we're doing the second course of motion design style frames. Yeah, we're good. Thank you, Molly. Do... Did we say that already? <laughs> we totally said that, but that's okay. <laughs> you know good, what? Good job, Molly. Good job, Molly. <laughs> Good job to wait. Uh, okay, you know what? The old me would be all over you on this. But the new me says, good job, Molly. That's the way to you do it. You know why? Because people need reinforcement. They do. That repetition is important. But I'm going to ask you for the rest of the show to be wholly present and to be right here right now. Okay. Don't worry about anything. Just be here with me. Let's go for a ride. Now, I want you guys to participate. Now, even though Molly has taken this class before, this is a new deck. I've reshuffled things, new graphics, and new components to it. Okay. 
So I just want you to be here and you guys that are watching this at home, play along. If you want to be a better storyteller because you want to write, you have a public speaking event, maybe you're building a website and you want to communicate these ideas, I find that a lot of these concepts are totally transferable to another industry or another application. So, so just think about that. That uh, That's a good segue into what I wanted to ask Chris about. Could you give us like a top level summary of what we're going to be talking about today? Yes, we're going to be talking about story structure, story formulas, things that have existed for some time. A lot of people are not aware of the formulas that exist, and so they go out and they try and write a story from nothing, and they have no framework. And when you learn the framework, it makes writing much, much easier. When you learn the framework to design, it makes designing much, much easier. And so that's the whole point today. So I've got a whole agenda. we got a deck. Let's dive in. Should we do that? Yeah, also I want to ask uh, the people, if you have any questions about what Chris is doing, it doesn't make sense, please ask it and I will read it off because, you know, we want to make sure that this is all making sense. Yeah, Yeah. now make sure, the, the key thing here is to make sure you keep it focused on topic. Please don't ask me any business questions right now unless it's directly related to story structure. And Aaron and Molly and Erica have been instructed to stop me whenever they want and just stop me and just ask whatever because we want to have this dialogue and they are your avatars they're your representatives so use them talk to them and then they will ask the questions on your behalf Absolutely. i've also instructed them to ask like dumb questions as if they were students and that way somebody who isn't able to because of the whole technology restraint here isn't able to ask their question aaron and molly will play that part there's no point for them to be super smart and be super smooth because then everything is so easy then you guys walk away scratching your head thinking, well, I wanted to ask that question, but I couldn't. So I've mm -hmm. asked them to be you, to be the student, and to forget what they know. Okay, so they're playing a role here today, as they always are, but I'm just reinforcing that at this moment. Let's get into the deck, guys, as I'm fidgeting around with my shirt. Design fundamentals, sequential design, story, structure. Here's the agenda. I'm going to do a quick intro. We're going to talk about the monomyth. And we're going to use Star Wars and the Matrix to understand the monomyth framework. And then we're going to talk about Dan Harmon's story, story circle. I'm sorry. And kind of my way of understanding story formulas and plot types. Apparently, there are not that many types of movies and stories that are written. And they say that Hollywood is the most formulaic industry on the planet. And that kind of seems surprising because we're always eagerly waiting to see the next film. But what if you realize one day that there are only a certain number of types of films ever made and they get repurposed and reskinned? So let's start off by doing something fun. Let's play a game. I want you guys to try to guess the movie. I'm going to read the log line and we'll talk about what the log line is in a different episode. But I'm going to read the log line to a movie. And then you guys quickly guess what movie it is. I'm going to ask Aaron, Molly, and Erica not to blurt out anything. Just raise your hand. Okay. Because if you blurt it out, the, our, our audience at home cannot play along. Okay. Are you guys ready? Hands on the buzzer. <laughs> and Molly, if you know this line already because you've been in my class before, <laughs> please don't say anything. Just chill out. Okay. okay? All right. You guys remember, Super don't say chill. it. Don't say anything because I want to be chill. Okay. Here we go. A shy youth inherits a simple gold ring that holds the secret to the survival or enslavement of the entire world. Erica knows it already. I Everyone guess. knows it. Everybody knows it. Okay, see how when you're able to reduce it down to something so simple that you should be able to know it. Erica, mm -hmm. you had your hand up first. What is this movie we're talking about? Lord of the Rings. Beautiful. Where's my sound effect? Ding, ding, ding. Hold on. There you go. Beautiful. Lord of the Rings. Excellent. Good job, guys. Did it, you write that, by the way? Because that was extremely well written. I copy-paste it from the internet, I believe. <laughs> I'm a good curator and editor of information. Did I write anything? You're a sifter. You're a sifter. I don't like a that. Colle a collector. Dark sifter. A thief. Yeah, okay. Lord of the Rings. Okay, here's the next one, you guys. Hands on the buzzer. Here we go. Fortunes change for a beautiful and kind-hearted young woman who is at the mercy of her adopted family when a ball for the prince's hand in marriage is announced. Hands up. Uh-oh. Don't say it. Hands up. Aaron has hands. Okay, don't say anything. Okay, so you guys are still thinking about it. Are they saying it on the line right now? Give them a chance here. Give them a second. Yeah, give them a chance. Uh, yeah, 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 I guessed it. Yeah, yeah okay. It. Okay, and Aaron, what is the answer? Cinderella. 
Cinderella. Okay, so right now we have one point for Erica and one point for Aaron. <laughs> Not that this is a game show, and there's absolutely zero prize for winning. Okay, you get the the uh, prize of knowing a job well done. Pat on your back. All right. Okay, let's keep going here. Next up, you guys ready? Hands on the buzzer. Yes. You guys grooving on this? Yes. Molly, thanks for playing along. I know you know all the answers ready. <laughs> Boom, here we go. Just before the outbreak of World War II, an adventuring archaeologist races around the globe to single-handedly prevent the Nazis from turning the greatest archaeolo archaeological relic of all time into a weapon of world conquest. Boom, Erica's got it. Sort of. <laughs> Molly's pretending she's a great actress. Okay, does the internet already have it? Yeah. Okay. And then, Eric, what is the answer? Indiana Jones. Beautiful. Aaron, did you know that? I was going to say Blade Runner, so I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you reading this? World War II. Just before the outbreak of World War II, that's a critical part, there's an archaeologist. Maybe Aaron is watching a different Blade Runner. That's not one of those parody Blade Runners, is it, Aaron? <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it's Harrison Ford. <laughs> well, you got the character right. Beautiful. Good job. All right, here we go. Next one. A modest space crew going home with their cargo stop to respond to a distress signal but are forced to confront a deadly alien who stows aboard their ship, leaving only one of the female members of the crew to fend for herself. Aaron's got that. Molly looks confused. <laughs> Erica is still thinking. The gears are grinding. It's fascinating, you guys. And Aaron, you watch the internet. Don't, Molly, don't look. Okay. Don't look. They're all getting it wrong. I don't understand. Really? Yeah, it's weird. Wow. Okay, so we're going to leave this up for a little bit longer. A modest space crew going home. No, I'm just kidding. Everyone gets oh, it. Oh, everybody got yeah. it right. Okay, Aaron, what's the answer? Alien. The word alien is already in the uh, log line here. Of course it's alien. Oh, I've never <clears throat> seen it. Oh, that's I've never why. seen Alien? Yeah. No. That I'd, movie scared wow. the crap out of me first time I saw it. I haven't that's really classic, seen it either. So. I, I want to see it, but I just haven't yet. Yeah, you're going to wait yeah. till you turn 50 to see well, it? I, I, mean... I got to find it. I need access to it. <laughs> It's not on Netflix. What am really? I going to do? All right. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So the question I have for you guys is, are there common plot types? Are there story formulas? And I think the idea of a formula it grates creative people the wrong way. It does. <clears throat> it feels like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a ball of intuition. I'm channeling higher energies. I'm channeling some power above me. And I'm doing this thing through the ethos, intuition, emotion I, I do this thing but then when you say it's a formula brother it, why does that offend creative people and I think the reason why is because we don't want to feel like it's easy that it shouldn't be easy that not everybody can do it and there's more mystery around our thing and so with mystery comes magic and I think that's why creative people don't like formulas well it just so happens that a gentleman by the name of Joseph Campbell who you guys should know and if you don't know before the show, you will know after this show. <clears throat> Joseph Campbell explores the theory that important myths from around the world, which have survived for thousands of years, all share a fundamental structure, which Campbell called the monomyth. Have you guys heard of the monomyth? No. You guys know what monomyth means? One story? Mono was one. And myth, myth is one, one myth. Story. One story. Okay. And it turns out also he borrowed that term the monomyth from James Joyce. Oh. So nobody's original, and that's totally okay. <laughs> yeah. And here's his book. He wrote this book. It's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. These overlaps between all these myths that have endured the test of time. And Aaron, I know you've read Robert McKee's storybook, so you should be very familiar with what I'm talking about today. So you do have a competitive advantage over your two uh, contestants on the right. Okay, so the monomyth... And, and what he said is, is this, a hero ventures forth, this is the formula here, a hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Okay. You guys understand this? Uh, I feel like that needs a little breakdown into regular yeah. English language. All right. Uh, can I try and see if I get it right? Go ahead, yeah. man. It sounds like so there's a guy, and then he's going about his life, and then some kind of outstanding situation happens to him, and then he conquers the situation and learns a lesson that he can then <clears throat> teach to other people or whatever. 
That's a really good summary, Aaron. Well done. Well done. Well, I'm glad you said that was really complicated because I'm, I take great pride in trying to help make complicated things less mm-hmm. complicated, to make them simpler to understand. And I'm, I'm really amazing because I can look on the Google. <laughs> You're really amazing. Yeah, I'm really amazing. Great. I could jump on Google <laughs> and steal an image that explains it so I don't have to like really think about it. Cool. And so that's what I've done. All I've done is redrawn it. That's it. Okay, so here's the hero's journey and phrased as a 12-step process. There's the ordinary world, the one that we all live in, and then there's a call to adventure. And what you're going to realize soon when I get into the story structure and the story formula is this resistance to change. And that's what a lot of stories are based on. They don't, people don't want to change. So there's a call to adventure, and what they do is they refuse the refusal of the call. They don't want to go. They're reluctant. Mm-hmm. They're afraid. They're scared. Something in them says, I do not go. This is when they encounter a mentor, and the mentor helps them cross the threshold from the ordinary world over to the special world. Here, they're tested, they meet allies, and they make enemies. And the approach is this internal conflict that they have to go through. It's what they're scared of. And they go through a big test, an ordeal. Sometimes it involves a death and rebirth. And they're not always literal. It's, it can be figurative, a figurative death. And then they realize something. There's a reward, and it's called seizing of the sword. And then they're tested again. They're put in this situation. Now they've learned something new, and so they're going to go back again, the road back, and then they're able to overcome whatever obstacle they couldn't before. Now they've learned something. They return to the normal world with an elixir a solution that they can share with their fellow man. That's the knowledge that they are able to gain from their experience. This is the hero's journey. And the inner journey mapped onto the same 12 points looks something like this. And this one might ring or hit closer to home for you guys. Okay? Oh, yeah. Here we go. This is the stuff Molly's going to (laughs) like for sure. You can see already, right? And Molly, are you familiar with Joseph Campbell? No, I'm not. I just looked him up. Beautiful. So here we are. Stay here with me. Yeah. Stay here with me. Okay. So the first part is the ordinary world. So the things that are in red is what's happening internally. There's a limited awareness that there's even a problem. You just go about on your in your day-to-day life unaware that there's a problem. The call to adventure happens, and now you have an increased awareness of need for change. Mm. And why do you refuse to call? It's because you're afraid and you're resistant to change. You do not want to change. The mentor helps you to overcome your fear. Mm -hmm. And once you cross over, you've made the commitment to change. Now think about marketing campaigns that are targeted towards you. Are you tired of doing this? Let's talk about, um, let's cut to me for a second. Let's talk about the introduction of the iPhone 1. I just recently got my iPhone 10, so I'm super thrilled, you guys. Look at this. Uh, You know, humble brag. Yeah. It's like beautiful display, right? (laughs) Now, when they introduced the iPhone 1, Steve Jobs was on stage and he was addressing the audience and he was talking about smartphones aren't very smart, right? They don't send email well. They don't surf the web well. They don't make calls well. They don't have great interfaces. And the funny thing is he was dissing the prevailing technology at the time, which was the Palm Trail 650 which is something that I had that I sort of liked. It was this meaty, chunky thing with a keyboard and buttons and a fat antenna and a crappy display. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, it made me aware that my ordinary world sucked. This is what happens. This is the call to adventure. The person makes you aware that your ordinary world is not great. And he keeps going on and on and on about how bad the existing technology Mm -hmm. is. And then he helps us to get over this idea. Like, I've just spent six, seven hundred dollars buying that Trail 650 or my Blackberry or whatever phone you were using at that time. Help me to overcome that. Why do I want to throw that piece of technology away and adopt your thing? I'm resistant to change. And he is the mentor here. He's the person who's going to bring us in into becoming part of the the Apple disciples. We're going to follow him to the promised land. And we're going to cross the threshold. Yes. All speakers are mentors. Okay. Believe it or not, all marketing campaigns that are done well are the mentors because they're going to help you overcome a problem that you're 
first of all, maybe you weren't aware of, and then you're resistant to change. Let's get back to the deck. Okay. Okay? And the part of the test and the allies and the enemies for an adventure makes sense, but in your own life, it just means you're willing to experiment with new conditions. Mm -hmm. I'll give the iPhone 1 a try. It looks cool. There are no buttons. Interesting. That means it can be anything, and they can rewire this the entire time. They can update the OS, and I have a brand new phone. Yeah. I'm buying what he's selling me. Then there's the approach. So now you have to prepare for major change. And notice here, there's a, a repetition of theme. I'm afraid to change. I'm resistant to it. I'm afraid. I'm making the commitment to it, but I'm still not ready for it. But you don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah. And I can't even see my own slide now. Just what does that say at the bottom? Under ordeal, death, and rebirth. Big change with feeling of life and death. Okay, so this is the part of the, the magician in terms of making stories compelling is you have to make little issues seem like really big issues. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes something will happen like, I remember this in my own life, uh, back when I had hair, if I had a bad haircut, I was like, oh, this is over. My life is ruined. My social life is a disaster. <laughs> that girl who's been ignoring me for sure will ignore me forever now. Oh, my God. Right? It's so dramatic. It's so dramatic. <laughs> yeah. Teenagers, and it's just like I'm going through it with my sons right now. It's like, bah, rolling my eyes. Like, it's not the end of the world that you didn't get the latest iPhone. It's okay. Yeah. You'll survive. You will survive. Okay, next up. The reward, the seizing of the sword. This is you accepting the consequences of a new life. Throw it back. There's a new challenge and rededication. This is when you're going to get tested. So you theoretically have learned something, but now you're really tested. The res resurrection is the final attempt, the last minute dangers that are going to test you. And when you return with the elixir, that's when you've mastered the concept. Okay, so I know this is very different than a normal, the future design fundamentals because we're not doing anything with Illustrator or Photoshop. I'm not critiquing any work. I hope you guys are hanging in there. I warned you ahead of time. Get some coffee. No, I love this. I'm definitely yeah, this into is, it. Yeah, this is I'm great. into it. Really? I took a, a class um, when I was at Ringling, and this is a great reminder for everything that I've forgotten. Beautiful. All right, let's keep going. Let's jump in. You know what? Star Wars. I knew it. I saw it coming. Man. You saw it coming. <laughs> yep. You know what? I was never a big fan of Star Wars logo. I'm a big fan of Star Wars film and the concept. But then when I put this logo on here in its kind of glorious, chunky typeface, it looks beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so nice. powerful. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So let's look at the 12 points from the hero's journey, the ordinary world called adventure, et cetera, all the way down to return with the elixir. And we will map it out. I struggled with this, you guys, a little bit because I was like, these words, these terms are a little confusing. But if you map it out, you will be surprised at how great of a student George Lucas was of reading The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And the story goes that George Lucas had been working on rewriting Star Wars for a number of years. And then he reread The Hero with a Thousand Faces and remapped his story and he found his story and it's become an enduring tale that's lasted decades, spawned a multi-billion dollar industry. Amazing. Here we go. Is this, hold on, is this A New Hope? Just no, to be clear? yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. I've never this seen Star Hope. Wars. I'm just it's like the first one ever. First one ever okay. in the 70s, right? Yeah. Let's hear okay, it. so here we go. Yeah. So the ordinary world, I'm not going to read the left column. I'm just going to read the right column, okay? Luke is a farm boy. He dreams of joining the academy. He, he looks into the stars and wonders his, his place in the universe. And then he encounters these two droids, and they play him a message. This is when R2-D2 plays a hologram for him, where Princess Leia says... Uh, help me, Obi-Wan. Help me. You're the only one. You're my only hope. You're my only hope. <laughs> Thank you. Aaron, I didn't know you were going to be so critical. On... I mean, you killed. You butchered the line. I had to jump in, man. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you get passionate about right, something. Sorry. That's okay. That's totally cool. And he feels obligated to help with the harvest for his uncle. He can't. He feels like he cannot leave. Okay. Okay, his uncle or not. And then he meets up with Obi-Wan, the mentor. First of all, he saves him from the sand people. And he gives Luke his father's lightsaber and reveals his heritage, that his father was a great Jedi Knight, planning in his mind that you are of great stock, that you are destined for the stars. And the reason why he's released 
from his obligation is because his aunt and uncle are killed. I believe the troop, the stormtroopers, Aaron, were looking for the droids because yep. they contain uh, some secret message and they had to take them down, right? Yep. Right. And so now he's free to deliver the secret plans. So they travel to Moss Eisley, and this is where he meets his new allies and makes some new enemies. And he starts to witness Obi-Wan using the Force. And when he uses the mind control, and he waves his hand and says, these are not the droids they're looking for. The stormtroopers, weak-minded people that they are, are uh, succumb to his powers. And then they befriend Han Solo and Chewbacca. They become his allies. But in doing so, they also make a new enemy in Jabba the Hutt. He has to confront his fears, so he's learning to use the Force. And it, while he's getting his training, they're captured by the Death Star. This super powerful weapon. It's the size of a moon and it could destroy planets. The ordeal, the death, and the rebirth. Well, they get captured. They have to fight. Uh, they make their way into a trash compactor thinking they made it out. Only to be kind of... There's some kind of squid snake creature that grabs Luke underwater. Okay, so he escapes the trash compactor, and then he witnesses Obi-Wan getting killed. This is also where they saved Princess Leia. They rescued yes, her. Yes, they, they did save Princess Leia. They found her, and he witnesses Obi-Wan getting killed. Obi-Wan sacrifices himself so that they can escape. And the reward seizing the sword, Luke is saved, and they learn. Uh, I think I'm repeating myself here. I'm sorry. I might have messed this up. They work together as a team. There it is, the road back. I'm sorry. Obi-Wan sacrifices himself mm -hmm. to help the team escape, joins the rebels on the Death Star attack, and the resurrection, the big, the big change, the final battle. Luke hears Obi-Wan's voice and uses the Force to make an impossible shot. The evil empire is destroyed, honored as heroes. That's the story formula, and I okay. freaking F, I messed up parts of that. I will no, fix I the deck. Followed. You follow? Yeah, even though I never saw it. it makes Great. Sense. Okay, let's cool. move on. Yeah. Now we're going to move on to the Matrix. And I, too, uh, have some kind of nostalgic feeling about the Matrix logo. It's kind of cool. Yeah. A little glitchy, you know, mm -hmm. the effect there. Mm -hmm. Well done. Well done. All right. Hopefully I got this one right. Okay, The Ordinary World. Now, you've seen The Matrix, right? I have, a long time ago. Oh, my God. But one I of have... the greatest science fiction yeah. films ever made. Changed yeah, my life. That top movie. five. Yeah. Maybe top three. Okay. I'm glad, Molly, you've seen a couple of films. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, The Ordinary World. Neo is an office worker, but he leads a double life. One is a hacker by night. One is an office worker by day. His call to adventure is he's told on a computer screen to follow the white rabbit. And hence, he follows the white rabbit. There's, an, there's a reference there to Alice in Wonderland, right? I was yeah. just thinking that. Yeah. The, the Wachowskis were very deliberate in how they constructed the story from the naming of the characters and the spaceships and everything else. And he's told to escape through a window. And he says, this is crazy because this is Morpheus talking to him, saying, go out the window. He won't do it. The meeting of the mentor, Morpheus is his mentor. He meets him. And he promises to show him nothing more than what is real, to tell him what the Matrix is because he wants to know. The crossing of the threshold is when Neo is given the choice. He takes the red pill instead of the blue pill to discover the truth of the Matrix. That's when he gets pulled out of the Matrix and he's brought into the real world and they're able to track him. To test the allies and enemies, now he's become an enemy of the agents. And he's being trained by Morph Morpheus in the sparring room and befriends Apoc, Switch, Dozer, Mouse, and a bunch of other people, including especially Trinity, who he falls in love with. They re-enter the Matrix to meet the Oracle to tell him his destiny. In going in there, he's betrayed by Cypher, Cypher and Morpheus is captured. At this point in the story, everybody is afraid of an agent. Nobody can fight or beat an agent. So they say, when you see an agent, you run. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the challenge here. This is the test. Because he has to go back into the bank lobby and fight his way into the Matrix to rescue Morpheus. Uh, one of the most amazing scenes, when they go through the metal detectors and they shoot that place up and they take everybody out. And both Neo and Trinity are doing these incredible moves, running up the wall and shooting people. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the reward. 
He starts to believe that he is the one due to his ability to do the impossible. He's dodging bullets, literally. Yeah. The road back, Neo, Trinity, and Morpheus attempt to escape the Matrix. Everybody gets out, except for Neo. Agent Smith stops Neo. The resurrection, literally in this story, it is the resurrection because Agent Smith kills Neo. And it would so happen that Trinity's kiss would resurrect him. And now he's able to see the Matrix for what it is and use the power of imagination to see things and do things that no computer program can do. So he defeats Smith easily with his newfound power. And the return with Elixir is now that he can do anything and his mind is totally opened. He warns the agents via a phone call that he's coming for them, that he's going to free humanity. Mm. Story structure. And there, and there are more stories that you can map this to. Yeah. Like Mulan. People are mm. saying Highlander too. Highlander? Which I never saw. Well, it Alice. Another classic. Yeah. Alice cult in classic. Wonderland. Yeah, pretty much. Alice in Wonderland. There's the monomyth for a reason. So hold on. Are all these stories, this structure you just laid out, every story, every movie follows this structure? No, not every no. movie. Uh, just hero ones? A love ones? story. I, I don't know of hero ones. I, I just think a lot of them follow this a formula. A lot of them do, okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about Mulan. <clears throat> let's see if you guys can apply what you learn. You guys remember the Disney classic Mulan? Yes. Yeah, with okay. With the Huns and, mm -hmm. and just trying to save China and all that kind of stuff? Oh, no, I don't. I Did do. you see it, Molly? I didn't see Mulan. No, no, I haven't. Well, shoot. I have. Okay, Maybe, is that I'll have to do you... it with Erica then. <laughs> okay. What's that? Aaron? No, is that you, you did your example? You prepared your deck with Mulan. I didn't prepare anything. No, no, I was going to say like let's apply it to something we all have seen to see if we can map the story out. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe we can ask the people. Well, it's kind of hard to have a conversation with the internet. Well, I've well, seen Karate <laughs> Kid. You guys, someone mentioned Karate. I've seen that. You guys seen Karate Kid? Yeah, but yeah. Does that apply to this formula? I I think it might. We can try. An adventure would be a little easier to try, like Lord of the Rings, Lord Mulan, of the Rings, Harry Potter. People have been Harry talking Potter. About Harry oh, Potter. Harry Potter. We can do that. Harry yeah, Potter. let's do that. <laughs> that one. I, <laughs> I mean, I've seen. The have first we all one, seen it? No. I've seen the first. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm not a big fan. Is the only problem. Yeah, same, same here. It's okay. like I can't talk about it. I don't know. Forget about it. All right. This is gonna be a disaster. Forrest Gump. <laughs> Forrest Gump. No. Is that? I don't know if that's the same kind of thing. The Seven Samurai. Forget about it, guys. Okay. Not enough of, of us have seen the same movies that map to this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. Okay. okay well, fine. Move on. So, so Joseph Campbell writes about the hero's journey, he creates this structure, and finds this pattern that exists with many, many myths. Okay. And then Dan Harmon has his own way. Uh, Dan Harmon is the head writer for Community. I believe that's the program. What is okay. that? It's a sitcom. It's a TV show. Okay. If you just type in Dan Harmon community, Molly, okay, you shall have your answer. Okay, so Dan Harmon creates this thing called the story circle. And you will notice that it is very similar to Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And this one may be a little easier for you to understand. So let's go through this, okay? okay. And it has eight steps to it. And we're going to go with the outer ring, starting with where it says number one. We're going to go clockwise around this thing. Okay. <clears throat> There's a comfort zone. That's the ordinary world, right? Mm -hmm. We want something, but we're afraid to do it. That's the fear. That's the reluctance, the refusal to the call to adventure. And it's an unfamiliar situation. What happens is then we adapt to it, and we get what we want. They get what they want, but they pay a heavy price. So when they pay the heavy price, they learn a lesson. Mm -hmm. So then the next time they encounter a familiar situation, they've changed. And somebody told me the formula for movies is this, is that good guys in movies change and bad guys never do. Yeah, Did that's you know a good that? point. Why does a bad guy never undergo some Because he never change? learns. He never learns. Mm -hmm. If you watch the latest movie, Thor Ragnarok, Thor changes, Loki does not. Loki almost always betrays him and grabs power. Hmm. That's just the structure. 
I guess that's a, that's a message there. The, the bad guy's just entrenched in his ways and can't see things another way. That's right. Now, I'll get into this, the reason why later, um, but I'll, I'll uh, kind of hint at, at what's happening here. We watch movies and we read stories so that we can learn something. So we see ourselves as the hero, and the hero needs to learn a lesson, and they change. Mm-hmm. And the way the villain acts is he never changes, so that's a tale of morality and a way of behaving. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be the hero, you need to learn to change. Mm-hmm. And yeah. if you want to be the villain, don't change. So it's pushing you in both ways. This is a little uh, carrot and stick. Carrot, be great, be celebrated, be honorable, be all those kinds of things, or be like Darth Vader and never change. Those I, characters I, don't change. I think also like in Star Wars... The, the villain represents the forces of antagonism, to use a quote from that book story. Mm-hmm. So that can't change, right? That has to be like a constant force that's trying to get in the way of the hero. And if it changes, then it's like, it makes it the story too confusing, I guess. Well, then there's no conflict. Yeah, no conflict, there's right. No conflict. You need to keep the conflict there. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you look at the inner circle now, and if you continue down that same rotation starting at the one point, you need go, search, Find, take, return. That's a lot easier to understand. Change. I'm sorry, change. Return and then change. Mm-hmm. Well, well, in this circle of the you need go find whatever. Yep. What's like that pivotal moment, like the climax of the movie? Where would that be? I think it's in the last part where you're tested. The take. The return like between find and take, or take and return. The return and change, I believe. Right. Return and change. Can you give me an example? Okay. Yes, I can give you many thinking. examples. Find a movie, and I'll tell you the example. Um, let's, let's, uh, find a movie. Rocky. Rocky 1. Okay. Let's talk about Rocky. Aaron, you're going to have to jog my memory because I'm not a student of Rocky. Okay, Rocky 1. He's like a bum bill collector for the mob, and he's kind of dumb. And then he's always been a boxer. And then the really famous boxer, Apollo Creed... He wants to. He's got no one else to fight because he beat everyone good. So they come up with this like marketing gimmick where he fights some humble, you know, down and out boxer and gives him a chance. And then <clears throat> you know they fight, and Rocky does a lot better than anyone thought he would, but he still loses. But then he kind of wins because he went the distance. And then I guess they agree to have a rematch or something. Okay. Was that a good summary? That's a pretty good summary. Yeah. That refreshes my memory here. So he loses yeah. his first fight. He's trained um, by what? Adrian? No, that's his wife. Adrian is his What's wife. What's it, Mickey? Mickey. Is his name Mickey? See, this is why we don't pick like really old movies that not everybody's seen. <laughs> this is problematic. Oh, but anyway, cool. so everyone's seen can, Rocky, man. Well, but I saw it like I 30 years I ago. Can Google it. It's, it's okay. Mickey. Okay. Okay. Whatever. So he loses his fight against Apollo, mm-hmm. and then Mickey tells him something, and then he's able to go back and beat him by the end of the movie, right? Doesn't yeah. he? Become... No, no. In number in number one, he just fights, and the climax is he loses the fight, but he went the distance. So it's like he won the victory of like you know he did it. What but did he learn then, Aaron? What did he learn that? Yeah. How did he go out of his comfort zone? He went out of it. He didn't want it. Perfectly follows the structure you laid out because at first he's like, No, Rocky's like, I don't want to fight this guy. I'm going to lose for sure. This is stupid. Right. And then his coach, Mickey, talks him into it. He's the mentor. Yeah. He's like, Dude, you've always been good. This is your chance. You're going to throw it away like you're so dumb. And then he finally talks him into it. And then they train really hard, you know, classic Rocky training scenes. And Does the push ups, the, the push up one handed, yeah. Upstairs. Run up the steps. That's, that's all no, I've seen you know, of the movie. That, the steps, yeah. The steps, yeah, I missed that part. And then he gets really fit, and then he fights Apollo Creed. And then it's like a really close fight, the whole fight. You, like, don't know who's going to win. Well, did he pay a heavy price? Did he pay a heavy he, price? He I lost. mean, he got his ass kicked. His eyes were all messed up. He, got, he was, like, super beat up. And he lost the fight. So, so Well, you know what? I, I, I think know. this is spiraling out of control, okay. you guys. Okay. I really do, because uh, I can't map that story because I'm not that familiar with it. Molly, okay. almost every single story that you watch, especially where the hero has to learn to do something, and I'm trying to think of one on the spot here, and we'll have to circle back to this a little bit okay. later. Is there a movie you've seen recently that you know vividly in your mind and you're having trouble mapping this to it, Molly? Um, no, I can't think of one right now. Okay, so let's hit pause on that, okay? okay? And then we can get into that a little bit later. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about the story formula. And we're, we've now gone through two types here of ways of understanding. They're very similar, and this is not going to be any different. 
And this is going to be phrased a little bit differently. I can't remember where I learned this from. Uh, I don't know if it's from a plot book or from one of these directing the story books. And I'll show you the references later in the books that you can read to further your knowledge in, in any one of the things we're talking about. Okay, so this is the story formula. It goes something like this, and it's very easy to remember this. I've taught this to my kids, and when we go to watch a movie, one of the obligations of going to watch a movie with dad, because dad pays, is you have to tell me what the story or the movie is about. And I don't mean going, and this happened, and this happened, and then that happened. That's how kids tell you the story. I mean to distill it down to this formula, and the formula goes like this. Somebody wants something and can't get it. The important part here is that it can't get it. That's why it's in red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to overcome a series of trials and tribulations, and instead of getting what they want, they get what they need. This is critical. Okay, why can't they get it? If the boy falls in love with a girl, and she says yes, and they get married, it's end of the story. There yeah, is there, no a conflict. conflict. And if you look at all modern day um, rom-coms, romance stories, there's always some kind of barrier. And I'll get into the plot device later, and it'll tell you exactly what that is. So you need to invent a reason why they can't get together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's find out some stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romeo and Juliet, why can't they get together? Because they're from different families. Like Their families hate each other. Thank you, Aaron. Their families hate each other. The Montagues and the Capulets, they hate each other. They couldn't hate each other more. It just so happens that both their prized children fall in love with each other. See the construct there? Yeah. And then they have to like be in love in secret, and then they get married. They don't tell anybody. It's just horrific. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is a, a comedy, believe it or not, even though you would think it's a tragedy. <clears throat> what is? Romeo and Juliet. Oh. It's considered a comedy <clears throat> in the plot type. Excuse me for one second. <clears throat> what did the family need to learn? Yeah. That love conquers all. No. <laughs> that is not what they learned. I don't know. They, they even tell you at the end of the play. They tell you at the end of the play. Well, like at the end of the play, the both of their kids die. So it's like yes. they both... Both families are really lose. Yes. And they hate lose kills? because they hate each other. And it's like their fault and their feud caused both of them to, mm -hmm. you know, lose their kids. And Okay. I'm not sure what the message is there. Their but... hate no, 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 no. killed their, their kids' love. Yeah. So, well, it didn't kill their kids' love. It killed their kids. Well, it so, killed them because they couldn't be together. Well, here's the deal. Their hatred and their feud was so longstanding that it caused them to lose the thing that was most important to them, their children. And then the story, they decide that this has gone on for too long and that they will no longer carry on this feud between the two families. They Is that how it ended? The ultimate price. Yeah. So they squashed the beef at the end? They squashed the beef. They come in, it's like our, our two families have, have uh, warred mm. for too long, we've hated each other, and it's cost us too much in blood. And we need to learn from this. So this is a story that you as the audience can look at and say, well, I hold prejudice against X kind of person. And the only person that really hurts is me. And it hurts the things I care the most about. And so that's a lesson you're supposed to learn if you're paying attention to the film. Okay, anyways, somebody wants something and can't get it. The can't get it part is really important because stories need conflict. You have to have conflict. So you invent something to keep them apart. In Sleepless in Seattle, that's the movie where it's like, you got mail, right? No, that... Or that's another movie. That it's oh, called You've Got one? Mail. Oh. The movie is... That's a different movie. Yeah. Well, what happens is in You've Got Mail is, I believe, Tom Hanks... Tom Hanks always plays these characters, so I'm, I get them confused. Tom yeah. Hanks is the owner of a, a multi-bookstore chain, right? Am I getting the movie right? Anybody watch movies and pay attention? <laughs> yes. Don't I never me. saw that movie. I, I never saw okay. it. All right, fine. Nobody pays attention to anything. No, we can do it's it. It's fine. It's, it's, no, no. it's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you anyways. I believe it's called okay. You Got Mail, and Tom Hanks owns like the Barnes & Noble of that world. And his love, Meg Ryan, I believe that's yeah. her name, Meg Ryan, owns an independent bookstore called Just Around the Corner. 
And she sees the neighborhood changing and these mega brands wiping out local mom and pop shops. And we see this happening in real life. So they're supposed to fall in love with each other. They flirt, they talk, but there's a big secret. Tom Hanks realizes who she is and what he's doing to her. He wants her to change and she won't because the entire bookstore experience offered at at the Barnes & Noble, they have music, they have coffee, mm -hmm. and she goes in there's like, and she will ask the sales clerk, where's his book? And he has no idea because he's a young kid. Mm -hmm. And she does something that's vital for the community, but I think ultimately her bookstore goes out of business because she can't change to the new world. So they normally love each other, but they can't be together because of some kind of conflict. I it could be that they love each other, but it's one of those things where you come from the wrong side of the train tracks, where it's a rich girl meets a poor boy, or rich boy meets a poor girl, like made in Manhattan, right? He, I think it was Jennifer Lopez played a maid, mm -hmm. and somebody else was a prince or, or some upper crusty kind of person. I didn't watch it, but see how the formula works? Mm -hmm. It could be that um, one of them is gay, where they fall in love, or one of them is their best friend, and they never saw the other person like that. Yeah. So there's always that kind of conflict. Okay, so remember, no conflict, no story. And this is where we bring in Mr. Robert McKee, who's very well known in terms of coaching people for screenwriting, and he has a book called Story. References to come. And my friend who read the book, I, I haven't read the book myself, he explained to me the most important concept in the book. He said the conflict comes from your subjective anticipation versus cold, hard, objective reality. The friction between those things is where the conflict happens. So we think things are going to be easier, but they become much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And the point, the reference that he said, okay, so like, look at The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, chime in here because I know you read the book and you're a student of the book, right? right? In The Lord of the Rings, Bilbo Baggins and Samwise Ganji or whatever the guy's name is, they're, they're told to take the ring they're, they're, they're the only ones that can do it, and they're simple, kind of loving, peaceful people to take the ring and just throw it in the volcano and be done with it in Mount Doom. Oh, you mean Frodo. That's Frodo? what he said. Frodo and Samwise. Oh, I said Bilbo. No, he said, said Bilbo. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. Frodo and Samwise, they're supposed to take the ring and just chuck it into Mount Doom and be done with it. Mm -hmm. And they think, because they're like halflings, they're tiny little people, and they think, oh, this shouldn't be that bad. <laughs> we'll, we'll eat our second or third lunch. And we'll throw it in the thing and we'll be done. Because if they entrust us to do it, it cannot be that difficult, right? right. So these guys uh, leave the Shire and it's a beautiful place, right? And it looks something like this in case you yeah. haven't seen it. And then what they realize is there are ring wraiths, there are knights and rangers that want to kill them, there are humans that want to kill them, there are dwarves at war, there are elves that hate. It's just, it's very problematic. And this is now cold hard objective reality. Mm -hmm. There's a flaming eyeball, literally a flaming <laughs> eyeball, and a volcano that you have to trek to and pass a bunch of orcs and goblins to throw the ring in there. <laughs> so this is when their uh, subjective anticipation should be really easy meets cold hard objective reality. And in the end, it's like, oh my god, like he's busted up. He <laughs> he loses a finger, I believe. I mean, yeah. it's just it's bad. He and his friend like don't want to talk to each other. He's going to pulled into the dark side a little bit. Uh -huh. Horrible things happen. Okay. When we talked about instead of getting what you want, you get what you need. There's an there's the implication here. I'm, I'm implying that the want is usually external. It's usually superficial. Okay. And the, the need is internal. It's some personal growth, a life lesson you have to learn. Okay. So here are some things I wrote down. And I just wrote this. And I'm not saying that. It is like well researched. Okay. What you want most time in a film, fame, fortune, power, acceptance, romance, something. Uh -huh. But it's an external want. You want mm -hmm. somebody to love you, to accept you, etc. It's like the hero doesn't really know what he wants. It's like masked by some kind of superficial thing he's trying to get, but really he wants something else, right? Yeah. yeah. This this now moves beyond the hero's journey. This is just normal story structure, so you don't even have to do an adventure tale. You just need to give the character an obstacle to overcome because they want something, they can't get it, and then what they want isn't what they ultimately need. Okay? Okay. What they need is to learn to forgive. And notice that there's acceptance here too, but this is acceptance of others versus okay. wanting to be accepted. It's, it's very different. Self-sacrifice, humility, generosity, and perhaps most important of all, Empathy. Empathy. 
So these are common lessons that the hero learns? Yes. In movies? Yes, or you need to learn through them. Now, okay. you guys remember watching Well Rider? No, I'm sure you don't because you don't remember anything and you've seen no movies, <laughs> but that's okay. What are movies? Yeah. <laughs> they used to be projected through celluloid, but that's a whole different story. Whale Rider was this young girl and she was the, I think, the firstborn of like a, a tribe in New Zealand or something like that. They have very traditional values and there were some issues about whales beaching themselves and the grandfather, the patriarch of this uh, small community, just would not accept her because he wanted a boy. He wanted a grandson that he could be proud of. So even though she did everything in her power, she hung out with the boys, she could hold her breath longer and dive deeper than any boy, she could do amazing things, he just gave her no attention. And all she wanted was to yearn for his acceptance. And it was very sad watching this thing. So what happens one day is uh, the whales beach themselves uh, and she decides my life is really not worth living and she thinks she has some magical powers so she climbs on top of the whale and she holds, kind of embraces the whale with her arms outreached and for some reason the whale gets up and he starts to swim back into the ocean and it's super sad. The whale swimming and she's holding on and you know at this point I think she's made the decision that her life doesn't really matter and she doesn't want to be an omen or a curse to her village. She just holds on to the whale and the whale swims out to sea. And then all the tribe's people witness this and are like, oh my God, what's going on? And she just goes. And you think, she's going to die. Yeah. She drifts out to sea and I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. Oh, I want to know. Oh, <laughs> man. Come on. What happened? I will tell you what happened. <laughs> they pull her out of the water. She's like lifeless. She's reserv you know, they, they, they bring her back to life. And the grandfather, he's broken now. He looks at her and he looks at her and says, What a brave, incredible girl. I've been so stupid. I've been so stubborn. I need to learn to love her as I would love any male child of mine. Mm -hmm. And so that was like <laughs> It was a tearjerker, guys. Yeah. It was a tough one because you I, cry? The whole movie I did cry. I did cry. The whole movie I was sitting there just Love her, just accept her, please, yeah. just, why? But that's where the conflict comes in, because mm -hmm. if he accepted her, there would be no freaking film. Yeah. All right. Now, the reason why we care so much about movies is because we're not separate from the characters we read or see. They are us, and we see ourselves in these films. Yeah. And that's why we need to learn a lesson. And it, it boils down to a fundamental human desire to seek pleasure while minimizing pain. So if we can watch a grandfather on a screen with little consequence to us, learn a very valuable lesson about accepting others, accepting his own daughter, and learning to get beyond his prejudice, sexism, mm -hmm. that we can be better human beings and we can forge stronger relationships. What was that movie with the whales and the old man? It's called The Whale Rider. Check it out. It's a really good film. Okay? So we, we seek pleasure while minimizing pain, and that's why we watch films. And that's from the book directing this story by Francis Glebal. And if you want to boil it down to even a simpler way to remember this, guys, yeah. you have to have an interesting character. They have to want something badly. And there's a main obstacle in the way. You guys probably want to screen capture this. There's an interesting character. They want something badly. There's a main obstacle in the way. And then we all, along the journey, get to learn a lesson with the character. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a minute about some things I do know about. Let's talk about the X-Men, because I'm a big comic book dork. Okay. Admit that. Totally cool. I saw Logan. That's one I Well, saw. what do you want? You want well, a prize I mean, for that? Like, there you go. Why don't you tell That's me about the story? Movie. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, Molly. <laughs> all right. All right. Mutants uh, are a different race. Uh, uh, there's Homo sapiens, which is humans, and then... Mutants are homo superior, and they're not accepted by society. And most of the times in these stories, they just want to be left alone. Just leave them alone. Yet they're hunted, they're prosecuted, they're tagged. There are people intent on destroying them because they represent a threat. They, they represent a threat to homo sapiens. And the reason why they say this is because homo sapiens exist and uh, Cro-Magnon does not exist anymore, and Cro-Magnon replaced Neanderthal. So each 
evolution of the human species replaces the previous one, and so they're, they're fighting to hold them back. And as you watch this movie, we understand the allegory here <clears throat> that it's not really about mutants that we care about. It's about minorities and tribes that are persecuted for no other reason than just being different. And I do personally have a little soft spot for this because, you know, as I've told you guys before, I have felt that way. I've felt as the outsider. Let's talk about Blade Runner 2049. Aaron, you've seen that movie, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, the new one? Yeah, I the new one. I haven't seen that oh, yet. Oh, I haven't seen the new one. Okay. I'm glad we are running a motion design firm here <laughs> where people care about films. But well, hey, man, I'll watch it when it comes out for a little lower price. You know what I mean? I hear you. I hear you. Can you? Okay, whatever. Blade Runner is about these replicants, and the replicants are hunted. They're literally hunted, hunted by people called Blade Runners. Whether you watch the original or the new one, it's the same concept. Yeah. They're hunted. And I feel so sad. Like, when I watch these films, my wife's, like, looking at me like, what's going on? You watch a rom-com, you're like, Wah! that's so stupid and fake. But you're watching these science, fil science fiction films, and yet you're, like, getting all choked up. You know, I'm like, like, hold on, hold on. I need to collect myself. It's because I feel like, why can't society just leave them alone? Mm -hmm. They're not hurting you. Just leave them be. Leave them be. Let them live. Okay. Plot types. You know what we should do? What? Before I get into the plot types, because this is the last leg here, is we should look at uh, any kind of comments or questions. What are people okay. saying? People were tripping that you were going to spoil the movie, so they were tripping for I don't, a second. I don't do but that, you don't you guys. do that, I don't They do don't that. know Come you on. that well, I guess. They don't know me at all, you guys. Get out of here. Okay. Aaron? Everyone keeps mentioning movies that they like you to break down into this thing. <laughs> okay, we'll do that some other time. And there's, some of them seem pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Maybe they can try to break it down themselves with what you... they've learned. I love that suggestion. Thank you, Erica. Why don't you apply the formula and identify a movie? Now, I, I will tell you one movie here because my son and I, my, my boys and I, we went out and watched Green Lantern way back, and I think it's Ryan Reynolds. Mm-hmm. Right? I never remember. It's Ryan Reynolds, Green Lantern, horrible film. Horrible <laughs> film. We watch it. I'm like, oh, what a waste of time. DC yeah. cannot get these movies right. Mm. And then I asked my boys. We're driving the car. And it always astonishes my wife the level of depth the boys can understand, even though they're probably six years old at that time. I don't know how old they were. Six and eight. Sitting in the back of the car, and these little two dwarfs sitting in the back. And I said, boys, what's this movie about? And my wife's like, oh, this is a mind-numbing, stupid movie. And I have to agree with her. Mm -hmm. And the boys say something like this. So I say, guys, what's the, what's the formula? Somebody wants something and can't get it. What do they want? He says, well, a Green Lantern wants his dad to be alive again. Okay. Spoiler alert. If you guys haven't seen Green Lantern, I'm going to do it right now. Okay. It's been like five years or ten years. It's been a long time. Fair warning. Tune away. Turn off the audio. Turn it off. Okay. Okay. So he's like, he wants his he wants his dad again. He wants to be with his father. So well, why can't he get that? His dad died. Can't bring him back to life. So he goes through these crazy things, and he has a lot of anger in him. He has a lot of anger in him. And what he needed to learn, and they tell me this, and it's like, what do he need to learn, boys? Instead of getting what they want, they need something. He needs to let go of his anger and to learn that it wasn't his fault because he was blaming himself for his father's death. Mm -hmm. I, if I totally butchered that, guys, let me have it in the comments below because it's been a long time since I watched that. But my little dudes can say some pretty profound things if you teach them the formula. If you wow. don't teach them the formula, they just watch a movie and they're pew, 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 explosion, pew, 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 <laughs> you know, and then ring and then the, the guardians or something and then it's over. <laughs> Explosion, explosion. But if you teach people story formula, it can make a big difference. Now, I, I also thought to myself, I've taken English class, literature class, all throughout high school and a little bit in college. Not once did a teacher sit down and break down for us at any one of these periods in my life to tell me what the story structure looks like. They're like, go ahead and write a story. Write an essay. Right? Have yeah. a thesis statement, three supporting paragraphs, have yeah, a conclusion. That's what they taught that's me. Just, it's just a basic framework. So true. That's, but that's they what never they do. tell you what is your character, what do they want, make it like life and death, put an obstacle in front of the way. And instead of getting that, they get to learn something about themselves that they need to grow. They need to forgive somebody. They need to accept somebody. 
That's the important part. And if I had learned that in high school or even in junior high, I think my career path and my life might have been different. So when you go to write a story, just make sure you identify those three things. Character, an interesting character that wants something and there's an obstacle. Those are the important parts. And the lesson? Uh, yeah, I had a about? question about that. Yeah, the go lesson. Ahead, Molly. You, you'll you'll, dis, oh, you'll just, extract the lesson okay. from that, right? right? Molly, go ahead. No, that was, I was just saying you left out the lesson part. Okay, Aaron, what did you want to say? Like, I noticed that in the story structure you laid out here, the character needs to kind of not want to grow. He needs to be kind of flawed. Like, you know, if he would just come to the conclusion and learn the lesson right away, then there'd be no story, right? Correct. If he so, was perfect. Yeah, if he was perfect. So a good story relies on the character being imperfect. Yes. I think that's interesting. You know why? We are all. We are imperfect. So we're going to learn through these characters. That's why I'm saying we see ourselves in these characters. So when you make a perfect character, say... Superman. Superman. I hate that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> he has basically nothing. Like one raw crypt, kryptonite can hurt him, and that's oh, it. Yippee. And he's all buff and good looking and can't die. He can't die. Uh, he's like, he can run fast as fast as the Flash. He has laser, he has laser eyes. eyes. Laser eyes. Whoever he's created like, Superman. Uh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's why Marvel uh, uh, exceeded DC because they created characters full of flaws. This is the genius behind Stan Lee and his collaborators. Because he created flawed characters. Daredevil is like Batman, but he's blind. That's a pretty big flaw. Iron Man is a genius advent- inventor, but he's a drunken alcoholic, and he's a narcissist. And he's just human, so this has a lot of flaws there. A lot of flaws. The Fantastic Four is a semi-perfect family, except for some of them come back all jacked up. Ben Grimm becomes the thing. And he hates himself. He looks at himself like, nobody can love me. Reed Richards is, like many genius inventors, he's, uh, what do you say that? Like, um, he's hard to get to know. Standoff-ish. He's cold. He's calculating. Bruce Banner, most powerful being on the planet. He's schizophrenic. See the genius of the characters? Yeah. They have flaws. Even uh, the big Lebowski would count, right? What do you mean? He has a flaw. He's a hero in the movie. Okay. And his What's flaw his is that he's a lazy, he's a lazy <laughs> bum. <laughs> <laughs> he's a stoner and just lazy. Yeah. 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 But so hold on. So then I was, my second part to that was like, so when you try to map this back to like m- me, myself, someone had a good question here. How do I apply that to myself? This whole story structure thing or like to a marketing sort of campaign? How's yes, that? I can help you right now. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to help you right now, you guys. Somebody wants something and can't get it. Okay, if I'm standing here and I'm looking at you, you want something, but something is getting in your way. And I have to help you identify what is the thing that you want. What are your goals? So maybe you want to get another job. Maybe you just want to put your portfolio together. Maybe you want to improve your design and topography skills. Or maybe you need help in negotiating a deal with a client because you keep getting the bad end of the stick. So that's what you want. Something's getting in your way. The client, yourself, Fear of change, technology, tools, techniques, access to education. Mm -hmm. Lots of things are getting in your way. So what I want to do is remove those barriers and give you what it is that you want. The better that I do that, the more likely you're going to watch the channel, the more likely you're going to subscribe, and hopefully, if you've received value from this exchange, to donate and become a sustaining member or buy a kit or something like that. And that's entirely up to you. So when I go on to stage or meet a client, I'm trying to help them understand what it is that they want. And I want to teach them the story structure without having to teach them. I do it by doing it with them. So the client is like the hero, Luke Skywalker, and you're like Obi-Wan? I am. Okay. And they're reluctant to change, Aaron, due to fear, due to complacency, a number of different things. Um, Maybe they're afraid of how this looks on the outside. So there's a lot of fear and resistance to change. But the fact that they're reaching out to us and that they've hired us says they're open to the idea. So they're about to cross the threshold, if you will. I need to help them get off um, Moss Eisley and Tatooine, and I need to get them to outer space. How do you do that? Well, I do what Obi-Wan does for Luke. He tells them of a better future, that he was the 
his father was a Jedi Knight, that he was meant to be a part of his thing, and he's going to help the Rebel, the Rebel Alliance, to mm -hmm. overcome a dark and impossible force. So this is very interesting here. Now we're going to get super crazy meta, like we're going to go within the dream, within the dream, and we're going to go into the Inception moment here. So I am the mentor, they are the hero. But what I need to teach them is they're not the hero, they're the mentor. Who's the real hero? The customer. Bingo, Aaron. Aaron is paying <laughs> attention today. You get one of those. Excellent, Aaron. So I say it's not about you then. It's about what your customers need. And I'm demonstrating that to you because I'm trying to give you what you need. So if I can package this up, you can then do this for your customers. And ultimately, that's how you're able to win and achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. Your customers need something. They want something and they have an obstacle as well. Let's identify who the customers are and what are the obstacles getting in their way. So this went super business and I'm glad you asked that question because now we're able to weave and dovetail all this together. I hope right now, especially if you guys that are watching, are going to be able to extract value out of it just for this part of it. Mm -hmm. This is where the gold is, okay? So if they're paying attention, let me know if they have any questions. We have the final stretch here before we go to lunch, guys. Okay. Uh, we have plot types to talk about. Uh, oh, I'll give it a minute. Give it a minute. I can play some music. What are we giving a minute? No, we're, oh, reading we're comments. Reading some comments. Okay. All right. Let's see. Some people. Molly are needs a library card to watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Among other things. Let's see. I like how this pivoted. My question, My question. please. What was your question, Milk Cro Milk Card? I'm wondering if these movies. That take these exact rules. This isn't a question. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. He wants us to break down another movie no. and map it to the... I'm trying to... I'll do that in another episode. Yourself. Another episode. Try it yourself. I love Erica's suggestion. Go do it yourself. Yeah. Um, someone asked, a perfect <clears throat> story is boring? Yeah, question I tried mark. to give that guy a shout out, but how do you make things show up orange like that? It, it, they do it themselves. Yeah. No. Um, yes, a perfect story is boring. Where's the conflict, right? Let's see. There's no conflict. questions, really. Okay. Let's... Yeah. If there isn't, we'll move on. Yeah. You you scanning on both Facebook and on uh, YouTube? No, let me look on Facebook. Yeah, flip over oh, to but Facebook. Like, a good story needs you need the conflict from exterior forces, like some kind of situation problem, and then you need the guy to be not perfect. You gotta have both. Yeah. Alice asks, "Can we have examples of how a story was done for a business?" Yeah, maybe mapping it more back to business. Now, like we got a good understanding and of the story. And design and all that. Okay, we can. We can. Or like a good not, marketing campaign sort of Yeah, thing. Allison, we can do that, but not for this episode because this is going to be part of a new series called Sequential Design. Oh, I'm going to teach people how to tell stories for a very specific medium and format. I, I, didn't, purpose, I didn't intend for it to go into this realm of business and mapping it to other things. Okay. That, that's probably like a copywriting class for a website or, or a brand marketing thing, which we've done too, but not, not for this. Okay, we good, Molly? Yeah, we're yeah. good. All we're right, good. let's jump into it, you guys. This is the last segment here. This last part is called plot types. And if those of you guys are sitting back, scratching your head, thinking, ah, there's these formula schmormulas. No, it's all magical and beautiful. Well, I'm going to show you how many different types of films there are. So or just, story types. Sorry, just to be clear, Chris, we're talking about like stories and movies. Y yeah, well, stories, period. Movie okay. is just the delivery format. It can be in a book, a comic book. You and I have talked about this before, Aaron. A story can exist in an oratory way, like where we just sit around a campfire and I tell you a story. They yeah. follow the same structure. And then once we learned to read and write, we wrote the stories down on pieces of paper. And then we made those things into maybe radio programs. We told stories that way again. Gotcha. And they're recorded. And then we made movies. And now we're moving into the virtual reality space, the augmented reality space. There's still a story. And they follow the same formula. So okay. it's important that you understand structure. And like within music, you need to understand structure as well. Right, Aaron? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just noise. Okay. So how many plot types are there in Western films? Um, how many formulas are there? What do you guys think? I think I remember this from your well, class. Well, don't say it then. <laughs> the one thing you remember from my class. Yes. Don't say it now. <laughs> All right. How many story types or plot types Aaron. do you think there are? Aaron or Erica? Or the internet, type it in. Just a number? A number, how many times? Someone's saying three, I was okay. thinking five. Okay. I was thinking three. Very good. That's all we got, three That's and five. That's all we got. <laughs> well, I was telling one of my students one day, like there are only so many types of movies. I'm like, how many types? I'm like, oh, I don't know, seven. I went on the internet, looked it up. There you are. <laughs> seven. Seven. 
That's what I remember. Seven types. Here we go. And they are one, the quest, mm -hmm. aka the Holy Grail. And I'll explain what these are in a little bit. Two, what I'm calling the manhunt. And the, the parentheses is what, uh, if you look it up, this is what they would say overcoming the monster, a manhunt. We got to destroy some, some monster. It could be another human being, it could be a serial killer, it could be literally an alien or a monster. Freddy Krueger or something like that. Mm -hmm. Metamorphosis. This is the classic rags to riches story. Mm. So if we only had three, that's where you would draw the line. But Aaron said five. The voyage and return. The comedy, which is an unnatural barrier. The tragedy is where the main character is a villain and they die. Oh, the main character is a villain and a yeah. tragedy? Yeah. Like Macbeth. What do you mean, oh, right? a natural barrier? I'll explain, yeah, Molly. Some okay. explanation, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is the high level. This is the screen capture moment. Number seven is the rebirth, the story of redemption. That may be the Rocky story. I'm not sure. Okay? Okay. The Holy Grail, the quest, that would be probably Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost mm -hmm. Ark, something like that. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the explanation of each and every one of these things. You guys can probably look this up on the internet. I did not write this. I just found it, curated, and dropped it in for you. Okay? That's what I do for you. Because I love you guys. Thanks, Chris. I do all the hard work. Okay, Thank the quest, you. the Holy Grail. The protagonist and some companions set out to acquire an important object or to get to a location, facing many obstacles and temptations along the way. The examples are Lord of the Rings, Indiana Jones. I'm sure you guys can fill in more films like this. They're looking for something, or they need to go somewhere magical. The manhunt. The protagonist set out to defeat an antagonistic force which threatens the protagonist and or the protagonist's homeland. Alien, Jaws, Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. many movies like this. Three, the metamorphosis. The poor protagonist acquires things such as power, wealth, and a mate before losing it all and gaining it back upon growing as a person. This is a classic story. Cinderella, Aladdin, Trading Places. You guys remember Aladdin? I think it's spelled wrong. Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay. You guys remember Aladdin? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I have it on VHS. Okay. Aladdin, <laughs> he, wanted to, he, felt like he wanted to be not a poor kid. He found mm -hmm. the genie, he wished for wealth and power, and he he falls in love with the, the princess. What's her name? Jasmine. Jasmine. He falls in love with Jasmine, and he, he's like very showy, mm. kind of braggadocious, and she actually fell in love with a little street urchin, mm -hmm. not this guy, and he wanted to impress her. And so then he goes through the battles and all that kind of stuff, and he sets the genie free and realizes she loves him for who he is, not because he's trying to be some sultan mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rags to riches, and you learn a lesson. Yeah, you did. The voyage and return. The protagonist goes to a strange land, and after overcoming the threats it poses to him, her, returns with nothing but experience. For example, Spirited Way, The Wizard of Oz, Where the Wild Things Are. I tend to find these things to be like these dream movies, mm. where you're not quite sure if it was all a dream. Right? Yeah. You're mm -hmm. not quite sure. Okay, the comedy. Believe it or not, it's a natural barrier. Wow. The protagonists are destined to be in love, but something is keeping them from being together, which is resolved by the end of the story. Uh -huh. Romeo and Juliet, you've got male, which we've talked about. The tragedy. The protagonist is a villain who falls from grace and whose death is a happy ending. Macbeth, The Shining, Scarface. Huh. Aaron, you want to... Yeah, no, some of this? I didn't want to. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, know you want to say something. No, Go I just, ahead. Yeah, that's interesting because that, when Scarface dies at the end, I mean, it, it's not really sad because it's like this guy was a bad guy. Yeah, so, this is a tragedy. Yeah, this is the the definition of it. So, the Shining, Jack Nicholson's character uh, loses his mind, goes bananas, and tries mm. to kill his family and everybody in it. Right? Yeah. A bit. So he yep. freezes in the maze, and we're all good. Mm. This does seem to be the formula for a lot of horror films. Somebody loses their mind. Someone said Breaking Bad. Have you seen that show? The, no? no, I've only seen a few episodes. I haven't seen the whole series. Breaking Bad is a tragedy. It there, is. Aaron, would you agree? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, beautiful. It's funny because I can see like once at the end of the movie, if, if like a cop were to break Don't down. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Remember, there's still people that. No, but like, I mean, it, even in Scarface, like he he felt bad that he killed his brother at the end. And but I mean, it doesn't matter. He still killed his his homie. You know. Yes, I don't need guy. to see the movie Even now. if he felt bad, mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. It's bittersweet. Thank you. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> the rebirth. This is a story of redemption. The protagonist is a villain or otherwise an unlikable character who redeems himself or herself over the course of the story. This is Avatar, I love Iron Avatar. Man. Classic. Avatar, he's a soldier who wants to do something in the outer world, right? Yeah. He's, I think he's handicapped. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's able to inhabit the body of a native, whatever type of people they are. He falls in love. And he realizes he's on the wrong side of this war. And she gets really upset at him when she finds out he's working for their team. And he has to redeem himself by stopping the soldiers that he used to call his homies, as mm -hmm. Aaron would say. And then he's basically redeemed himself. And he sacrificed his body to then become this other character. Yeah. Well, since the people want some more examples, I have some examples for you. Oh. See how I just think of everything? Yeah, you do. Look <laughs> yeah. at that. I'm like the, the, the best maitre d' at the hotel. You're so good. Okay, I have three movies to, to talk to you about. This one's The Truman Show, and I have a frame for it. Some of you guys remember The Truman Show? Yeah. yeah. So what I'll do, great. it was a great film. And I love this image, too. It's just the perfect image to encapsulate the film. Mm -hmm. he, he's living in a fake world where everybody's watching him, and everybody's in on the joke except for Truman. Mm -hmm. It's super sad. Yeah. So the synopsis is like this. And what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you, if you go back and look through the seven types of stories, see if you can identify, as I described the synopsis, what story or plot structure this is following. Okay. Okay, one of seven. Molly, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go back to the seven types here. And you're going to screen capture this for me. Okay. And then you can have it up so we can cross cut to it. Okay. Let me know Hold when on. you're done. Let me see. Screen capture, Molly. I know it's... Command shift three. I know there's a delay. She, she's okay. getting to it. Okay. Hurry up, Molly. Somehow, can you see this or no? Yeah. Okay, you got it? And then you're going to get it on your machine, right? Yeah. There's a little delay there. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. could always just keep it paused. Okay. You good? I'm opening it now. No, you don't have to open it. You captured it, right? Yeah, I captured it. So I'm going to move again. on. Okay. So here I go. I'm going to move to the Truman Show. And as I read this, Erica can then cross cut or whatever so you guys can have this as a reference. Okay? So here we go. As I read this, you guys tell me which one of the seven plot types this is, and I'll show you how formulaic this is. So Truman Burbank, the unwitting star of the most popular TV series in the world, lives a seemingly perfect and ordinary life, free of pain or suffering. But Truman is not happy because his life is repetitive and predictable. He wants to see the world. He dreams of going to exotic places. But the TV producers and town full of actors conspire to prevent him from ever leaving. With great determination and courage, his will to leave is tested as he confronts his childhood fears. Okay, thanks for doing that now. Now that I've read that, which plot type is this? Are you guys seeing um, this? Yeah, I'm thinking. It's kind of like three mixed together. It could be. The pain of I feel like it's quest, manhunt. It's not a manhunt. No, there's He's no... He's not trying to find a villain or a monster that threatens his world. So take that out. Rebirth. You're going to take out the quest because he's not looking for some kind of magical object or magical place. Voyage? Oh, no, wait. Maybe it is just quest? You think it's a quest? No, he well, said no. He's... Okay, so voyage. Well, check it out. Here it is. Ready? Yeah. What does the internet say? You guys. Let's see what they say. Future first, fans. Because this one's a tough one. This one's a tough one. I'll I'll sit on this for a second, and then we have to leave. Comedy and rebirth, voyage and return. Okay. Some good ones in there. Okay. The rebirth is he has to start out as a villain. Voyage and return. Comedy. 
Comedy? People Boom, think it's, it's comedy. comedy. Oh. It's a comedy. And here we go. Let's look at the comedy. A comedy's framework is there's an unnatural barrier, okay? All right? There is also a love story in here, too, because he falls mm -hmm. in love with one of the actresses from the film, uh, from the set, and she tries to communicate with him. She gets fired and removed off the set. So here's the framework, okay? And I wish I could cross-cut these two things, but I'm not going to deal with that right now. The unwitting reality TV star and a compassionate cast member are destined to be in love. But the TV producers, the cast of the fictional town, are keeping them from being together, which is resolved by the end of the story. Hmm. Okay? Okay. Let's go on. Here we go again. You guys get two strikes at two more strikes at this. Here we okay. go. Two more swings, two more at bats, as they say. All right. The Wolf of Wall Street, you guys. You guys remember this film? Yes. Jordan yeah, Belfort? Nope. One. Leo DiCaprio? Yeah. Okay, I don't think Erica's never seen a movie or something. I've Here never we go. seen that movie. Here we go. Synopsis. A New York stockbroker, Jordan Belfort, forms Stratton Oakmont with partners Donnie Azoff and becomes immensely successful using a pump and dump scam and slides into a decadent lifestyle of prostitutes and drugs. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the FBI begin investigating and ultimately get Jordan to gather evidence against his friends in exchange for leniency. After losing his family, business, and fortune, Jordan becomes a motivational speaker warning others of his mistakes. This one's Rebirth. Easy. No, tragedy. No, because he doesn't die in the end. Oh, does he have oh. to die? Metamorphosis? Yes, a tragedy is when the villain dies. Oh, Maybe metamorphosis, metamorphosis? but um, um, reverse. Like he goes from riches. rags to riches back to rags. rags. Well, let's see what... I want to give everybody a chance okay. to say before I reveal the answer. I say tragedy. It's my vote. Rebirth. Let's see what people say. That's what I yeah. say. Or... Okay, let's see what the people say. In three, Earth. two, one. What do they say? Uh, where are they? Um, rebirth. Rebirth. Redemption. Metamorphosis. Three and seven. Rebirth. Yeah, maybe two Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? The answer is metamorphosis. <laughs> this is a rags to riches story. It even says rags to riches in the yeah. story. Guys, an ambitious stockbroker quickly acquires vast fortunes. He does stupid things with that money, illegal things, loses it all, and learns a valuable lesson. Last one. Her. Her. Beautiful film, Spike Jones. Love this film. Joaquin Phoenix. No, that, is that his name? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's the synopsis, guys. Ready? Hands on the buzzer. Here we go. This is the last one, and we're going to wrap the show. Theodore is a lonely man, still wounded from his divorce. He quickly finds himself drawn into his new intelligent operating system, Samantha. They grow closer and eventually find themselves in love. Like any couple, Theodore and Samantha deal with social taboos, intimacy, joy, doubt, personal growth, and jealousy. I know, I know. Shh. I got it. Okay, everybody lock in your answers. Don't say anything. This is the last one. We're going to end the show. Guys, everybody on the internet, what do you guys think this is? What is her? What plot type is this? You want me to look at oh. it? Okay, ready? Yeah. I say I say five. It's my like, my guess. Comedy? Five is comedy. That's what I Erica? say too. Comedy. comedy. Unanimous. And you know why? Because the word love is in there. It's pretty obvious. Boom. Comedy and a natural barrier. So these are two people who should fall in love, but one uh, they can't because Sam's uh, a computer <laughs> piece of, piece of software, and Theodore is just a lonely divorced guy. Yeah. Right. So there it is. Sam helps Theodore with his divorce and falls in love with him in the process, but. He is human while she is a sentient program. Their love overcomes many issues, but she evolves beyond his human comprehension. That's it, guys. Now, we could do this ad nauseum, <laughs> ad infinitum, and just keep going on and on and on, but we're not Yeah. because we have to eat lunch. Mm, food. Okay, here we go. References here, guys. These are some resources for you. So Joseph Campbell here with A Thousand Faces. We'll, we'll give you the link on Amazon after this mm -hmm. in the show notes so you guys can get the book. we we'll recommend it. Robert McKee and Story. He's a very sought-after guy who teaches screenwriters how to write. I recommend that book a lot. That's a good one. That's a ringing endorsement from Mr. Aaron Zakele. <laughs> okay. Directing the Story. This is a great book. It's written really well. 
beautifully illustrated from a story point of view, some storyboarding stuff in there. It's awesome. Really great concepts about what's happening while you're watching the movie. And lastly, Framed Ink. This one is more about storyboarding and lighting shots. It's written by Marcus Matteo Mastre. How do you say that, Aaron? Matteo Mastre. 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 Okay. Mastre. All right, we just. <laughs> <laughs> French people, please do not get upset at us. That was Aaron and Erica making fun of you. I just tried my best. Uh, Dream World production design for animation. Beautiful book. Incredible design. If you want to get better at storyboarding, check out this book. Hans Bacher. I believe that's how you say it. We're going to get out of here. You guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for powering through this super deep episode on story structure. I'm going to get us out of here, and I'm going to roll the theme song, and we're going to let it go.